Our scripture reading this morning is from Revelation chapter 22. Uh, It is the last chapter in the entire Bible. Uh, Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 7. The sermon title this morning, Here at the End of All Things, refers to something that Frodo said uh, to Sam after they had destroyed the ring uh, on Mount Doom at the end, uh, well, near the end of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. They thought that uh, they were going to be destroyed there on that mountain, but little did they know that in many ways in their lives, what they thought was the end was really just the beginning. And that's what we learn when we come to the end of the scriptures as well, that what we think is the end is really just the beginning. So read with me now as I read from Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 7. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. The word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you promise to come soon, and we do. We ask for it. Come soon, Lord Jesus. You have risen. You sit at the right hand of the Father. You rule over all things, and you will come to put to right everything that is wrong. We pray, Lord, hasten that day, and while we wait, May we, even through this time of worship, be transformed in our hearts to lean into what it means to live our lives in light of resurrection hope. We ask it in your name. Amen. I have a friend whose name is uh, David Cassidy. He lives in Nashville, Tennessee. Actually, David was supposed to come and preach next week here at Christ the King in Houston. That isn't happening, of course, but... He told me a story a little while ago that I found really amazing. He has a friend whose father passed away several years ago. A man, uh, the man who passed away is uh, from what is known as the greatest generation. His name was Bill Bagwell. Nobody ever called him Bill Bagwell. They actually called him the general, even though I don't think he was really a general, but they called him that anyway. But when Bill Bagwell was 17 years old, he left Texarkana, Texas, to join the Navy. This was in 1936, and he was stationed at Pearl Harbor. Now, we all know what happened to Pearl Harbor in 1941, and Bill Bagwell was there. He survived the attack on Pearl Harbor, and he went with the Navy to the battle in the Pacific, where he was wounded and captured in the fall of the Philippines. He was taken to Osaka, Japan, where He languished in terrible conditions in a POW camp, just like the movie or the book Unbroken, if you're familiar with that. He survived that camp as well, and he left that camp in 1945 when it was liberated by American soldiers. It took an entire year, a whole year, for Bill Bagwell and his friends who were in that camp to be slowly nurtured back to health so that they could return to the United States in 1946. And so in 1946, Bill Bagwell stepped off, stepped off of a ship in California. He picked up a payphone, and he called his dad. His dad answered the phone. He said, Dad, this is Bill. And before he could get any other words out of his mouth, his dad hung up on him. What in the world? He hung up on him. Well, 
Bill was undaunted, and so he caught a, a bus, and he took that bus all the way from California back to Texarkana. And when he got off the bus, he went to a bar across the street from the train station. He borrowed the phone from the bartender, called his dad again. Dad, this is Bill. I'm at the bar across the street from the train station. And again, without saying a word, his father hung up the phone, hung up on him. And Bill was flummoxed. What in the world is going on? Well, here's what's going on. The only word that Bill Bagwell's parents had received about him from the time that he went from Pearl Harbor to the Philippines was that Bill Bagwell was killed in action on the Philippines. The death certificate had been issued. The memorial service had taken place. His family had actually collected life insurance money from the United States government. So Bill Bagwell's father thought that somebody was playing a, a cruel and horrible prank on him, pretending to be his dead son. But his father also happened to be the sheriff of Texarkana, and he was upset. And he was going to teach whoever was playing this prank on him a lesson. So he strapped on his duty belt with his gun. He got in his patrol car. He drove from his house to that bar across the street from the train station. And he walked in and he looked up and there stood his son. Very much alive. And those two men in that moment, in that unbelievable and unexpected moment, simply embraced one another and wept. We read in the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of this same mix of disbelief and joy when Mary Magdalene and Mary first went to the tomb and found it empty. Jesus then appeared to his disciples, and there was that mix of disbelief and joy. Disbelief particularly with Thomas, who has come down to history, known as Doubting Thomas, who wanted to put his hand in the wounds in Jesus' hands and in the opening in his side. And then joy upon the realization that it really is true. Jesus is alive. That's not only the good news of Easter. That's the great news of Easter. But maybe right now you're finding it hard to lean into and live into the news of a risen Savior who rules and reigns over all things. You're finding it hard to believe because for all of the world it doesn't look like it could possibly be true, right? You look around and you don't see much evidence of it. We're being told that in Houston we're coming to the peak of the virus here in a couple of weeks and that we're supposed to brace ourselves. Online alcohol sales are up 243% in the United States and alcohol sales overall are up 55%. And we are told that the state of Texas is actually leading the way in that. The largest online platform for pornography has done the disastrous disservice of making their content free. And their traffic is up about 12% during the quarantine. Child abuse and spousal abuse is on the rise because abusers are at home, and now sometimes they're at home and unemployed, and those who are victims and those who are being abused are trapped in quarantine with their abusers. And maybe you have lost your job, or you've been furloughed, or you've taken a salary cut, or you've had to make really brutally painful decisions about people that work for you or with you because of this economic downturn. It really is enough to make us all think that Easter is just a cruel prank, right? Jesus is alive? Really? I don't see it. And that's why I want to focus your attention this morning on the end, the end of the Bible, the end of history on this earth, but the beginning of life in the new heavens and the new earth. Because through this beautiful vision of the future, we are called to new hope in the present. Through this beautiful vision of the future, we're called to new hope in the present. Now, if I had time this morning, I would have read all of Revelation 21 and 22. It's the culminating scene of Revelation's portrayal of the full and final defeat of Satan 
by our risen Savior, Jesus. Satan being destroyed in the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 20, and then everything becomes new. New creation, new life, new relationship, and new vocation. Our call. Your call, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, is to lean into this new hope and then to live your life now in light of it. And the first manifestation of new hope is new creation. Verse 2 in Revelation 22 mentions the street of a city down the middle of which flows a river of crystal clear water. Now that city is beautifully and graphically detailed in chapter 21 as the New Jerusalem. And before I go further, I need to remind you a little bit about the type of literature that the book of Revelation is. About a year ago, uh, I preached a sermon. Our our pastors actually preached a sermon series through the book of Daniel. If you want more information about that, you can go back and listen to some of those sermons. But briefly, Revelation belongs to a type of literature known as apocalyptic. That's actually a technical term. It's not what we're living through right now. It's a technical term that refers to literature that is characterized by graphic imagery and symbolism. Revelation is, as John tells us at the very beginning of the book, a vision. It's a vision, so it utilizes imagery and symbols to express what simple prose could not possibly express. And it's also meant to be practical. Revelation is practical theology. It's not a code to untangle. It's not a puzzle to put together. It's not a mystery to decipher. It's a vision of the full and final defeat of Satan and evil by Jesus that helps you persevere in the present. That's what Revelation is. So if people ask, do you think that the book of Revelation should be taken literally? I say, absolutely it should be taken literally, provided we are all working off the same definition of the word literal, which means this the sense in which the author intended to be understood. The word literal means the sense in which the author intends to be understood. So how does John intend us to understand the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven and landing on this earth in chapter 21? Well, what he means to communicate here, what God means to communicate here, is this. It is the city of God whose citizens are the people of God. In other words, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven is the purified and perfected church. The bride of Christ, as the angel refers to it in chapter 20, verse 9, coming to inhabit the new heaven and the new earth, bringing heaven and earth together. It's a new creation inhabited by all of those throughout all time who have been purchased by the blood of our resurrected Savior. So do you know what this means? It means that if you are a follower of Jesus, this new creation is your longed-for and hoped-for home. It means that what you suffer and struggle with now on this earth, those things are temporary, they're fleeting, they're passing away, and they will pale in comparison. There will be no memory of these things. They'll be long forgotten in light of eternity in the presence of your Savior. It means... You won't have to cover your face when you go outside. Or you won't have to wonder, should I shake my friend's hand? Because you won't just shake hands. You'll embrace without fear and without the awkward pangs of shame that are induced into even our very best relationships now. This also means that this thing that you are a part of because of your common faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, this thing called the church truly is the community that endures into eternity. The church is created by God through his pursuing grace, and it will be perfected by God through the continued work of the Holy Spirit until all things become new. And this church, this new community that you are part of by faith in Jesus Christ, now exists for God's continued mission on this earth. God is a church for his mission, and by faith in Jesus Christ, you're a part of it. It's a magnificent vision that allows you now, even in the darkness, to lift up your head 
and proclaim, I will arise because my Savior is risen and he reigns forever. You're a part of that new creation. The second manifestation of new hope is new life. The imagery in verse 2 is so beautiful that it really brings you to tears. John sees in his vision a river, crystal clear and flowing through the center of the new community, the new Jerusalem. At its headwaters are the throne upon which the Father and glorified Son sit. On both sides of the river stands the tree of life, bearing fruit in its season with green leaves which are for the healing of the nations. You see, this is new life. It's new life in Christ. Verse 2 of Revelation 22 brings us all the way back to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 2, where God set Adam and Eve in a garden. A river flowed through this garden, watering it, and out of this garden grew a tree, the tree of life. But when Adam and Eve ate from the tree that God had commanded them not to eat from, when they fell into sin by rebelling against God and disobeying his commands, God banished them from the garden away from the tree of life because he was gracious to them. He sent them away so they would not eat from the fruit of the tree of life because if they did so, they would be confirmed in their sin forever. But God had a different plan for them. His plan was to pursue them, to redeem them, to purchase them back. And all of their progeny, all humankind who fell into sin because of Adam and Eve's first sin. God said an angel to guard the tree of life because he is gracious. And he would not let Adam and Eve be confirmed in their sin and separation from him, just like he would not let you be confirmed in your sin and separation from him. Rather, he pursues all the way to the extent of sending his own son, Jesus Christ. So now what? Now there's new life. Eat from the tree of life. Be confirmed in your, uh, in your relationship with God. Your new life in Christ cannot possibly be taken from you. It's sealed by the sacrifice of Jesus, the Lamb of God. And it is guaranteed to be true by his glorious resurrection that we celebrate on this day. There is new life by faith in Christ. Take of it, lean into it, and live by it. It will not, it cannot be taken from you. The third manifestation of new hope is new relationship. Look at verse 4. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. You can't overestimate the power of these words. In Exodus chapter 33, Moses, whom the Bible says spoke to God as one speaks to a friend, asked God if he could see his face. And God answered him and said, You can see me, but you cannot see my face. I will hide you in a cleft in the rock. I will cover your eyes until I have passed by you. And you may see my back, but you may not see my face. Why? Because God said, No one may see my face and live. God is too holy. Our sin separates us from him. If we were to look upon the face of God in our sin, we would be consumed by the white hot fire of his holiness. No one may see the face of God and live until the new heavens and the new earth where God's people will see his face. By the blood of Christ, not only are you forgiven of your sins, your relationship with God is restored to the extent that you can stare into the face of his holiness with no fear, with no shame. Because you belong to him. His name is on your forehead. You are his. You are fully and finally concerned, confirmed in the sinless image of Of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that possibly being true? 
Can you imagine standing in the presence of God himself with nothing to hide? Can you imagine looking at him and him looking at you with no judgment in his eyes? No condemnation? No look that says, I'm not really mad at you, I'm just disappointed. But looking at you with nothing but love, with nothing but absolute delight. That is your future if you trust in the resurrected Jesus. Finally, the fourth manifestation of this new hope is new vocation. And right now that word vocation is a little sketchy, isn't it? With six million Americans alone filing for unemployment last week, with the oil and gas industry uh, woes rippling far and wide across our city's economy, with families struggling to juggle work that you're paid to do with the demands of keeping your children moving through school. If nothing else during this time, we have come to fa- we, we've come face to face with the fact that if you are putting your heart, if you are resting your heart on your vocation, on your work in this world, and on the material benefits that, that it provides you, you have found that that cannot support the weight of what you're putting on it. It's tenuous at best. It leads to deep, deep pain. Because, in fact, you are created for more. Look at verse 4. The Lord will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Who is the they that will reign forever and ever in the new heavens and the new earth? Is it the triune God who sits upon the throne? They're, They're there in that city. But the they is actually speaking of the inhabitants of the new Jerusalem. The they is you. It is all who inhabit the new heavens and the new earth through faith in Jesus Christ. This beautiful image again invokes the Garden of Eden where God gave Adam and Eve meaningful and dignified work to do even before sin came into the world and frustrated our work in this world. It was the vocation of human beings to tend, to care for, to cultivate, to rule over the creation of God. And it will be again. It will be again again. It will be again when you are not tossed around by a cursed creation that produces thorns and thistles for you when you set your hand to the plow. It will be again when you are not locked in your home due to a highly contagious virus that could only be manifest in a world that is marred by sin. It will be again when you will hug people without fear and your body will will not fail you due to chronic or acute illness. It will be again when all who would seek to perpetrate evil against you or anywhere in this world will be judged and cast out and death will be no more. And you, you who trust in the resurrected Jesus will reign with God. A new vocation forever and ever. That's God's vision for your future as a follower of Jesus. But here on this Easter Sunday 2020, the infamous Easter Sunday of 2020, when we're unable even to gather together to encourage one another with those words, He is risen, it feels a bit more like fantasy than reality. It just seems so far off. It even seems unattainable. So could it be true? How can we cling to this promise? How can we lean into it? How can we live by it even when we see it through a glass dimly? Easter, that's the way. If Jesus rose again from the grave on the third day, the glorious future of Revelation 22 is sure and it is certain. If he did not, then all you've got, all you've got to live for is what is right before your eyes. But the good news is this, he did rise. Those who witnessed him went to gruesome and horrible deaths, testifying to the fact that they saw him. They would not alter their testimony no matter what torture the world threw at them. Jesus is risen. He sits on his throne. The glorious future is set before you. Now we are called to lean into it and live in light of it. 
About a week ago, a, a good friend of mine who's a pastor in another city sent me a picture. It was a picture of a wedding that he was performing just last week. In that picture that t- was taken from the back, there was a vast, empty sanctuary, a bride and a groom, and a pastor, him, who was wearing a mask and standing six feet away from them. Three people plus a photographer spread out at a safe distance in a place where hundreds of people were supposed to be gathered, where hundreds of people were supposed to be witnessing a joyous and amazing event, where hundreds of people were supposed to leave that event and go to a big party to celebrate that event. Now it was four people in a room, at least one of whom was wearing a mask and you couldn't even see his face. Now, there will be a party for that bride and groom. Somewhere down the road, when it is safe again to gather, they'll repeat that ceremony in that sanctuary, and they'll all leave and they'll all go celebrate that wedding, that marriage. But until then, this is true. The full reality is already confirmed. These two people are husband and wife. Reality is confirmed. The celebration is is deferred. That is your life today. If you bow the knee of your heart and you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, the resurrected Savior. All that is promised to you and held out for you in Revelation 22 is your reality. It is confirmed by the resurrection of Jesus. The full experience of it the celebration, the party, the wedding feast with the Lamb, well, that's deferred. But it will come. It will come. In these days of darkness, lift up your head to the light of what has been confirmed to you by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. New hope in a risen Savior. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we approach your throne this morning not as one who remains in the grave, but as one who lives, as one who holds out hope for us that there will be a day when you will wipe every tear from our eyes, where death will be no more, and where we will reign with you in the new heavens and new earth for eternity. Again we ask, Lord Jesus, hasten that day, but while we wait... Let us wait with the hope that is confirmed in the resurrection of you, dear Jesus. Amen.